Welcome to Berkeley Conversation, hosted by UC Berkeley School of Public Health. My name is Michael Liu, I'm the Dean of the school, and today we continue our series of conversation on COVID-19, focusing on reopening and reimagining. Now, many of you have already sent in questions in advance, questions such as, how bad are things gonna get? How do we reopen safely? What's new around testing and therapeutics? At when are we gonna get a vaccine? And what must we do differently in the post-pandemic world? Now, to answer your questions, we put together a panel of experts to give you the most accurate and up-to-date information. Today, I'm joined by Dr. Eva Harris, Professor of Infectious Disease and Vaccinology and the Director of the Center for Global Public Health at UC Berkeley School of Public Health. Dr. Ziet Obermeyer, Professor of Health Policy and Management at the School of Public Health. Dr. Art Rangel, Chair of Epidemiology at the School of Public Health. Dr. John Schwartzberg, Professor and former Director of UC Berkeley UCSF Joint Medical Program. And Dr. Fedor Ernov, Professor of Molecular and Cell Biology and the Scientific Director of the Innovative Genomic Institute, which I'm proud to add is headed by Dr. Jennifer Downer, Berkeley's latest Nobel laureate who just won a Nobel Prize in chemistry last week. Now, we got a lot of questions today, uh, and so let's get started. For those of you who are joining us uh, on Facebook Live, if you'd like to ask, at, at, ask a question, uh, please just go ahead and type in your questions in the comments section, and we'll get to as many of them as we can. So we'll start with Professor Reingold. Art. Recent data suggests that some parts of the country may be on the verge of a third wave of COVID-19. The first wave peaked in mid-April with about 32,000 cases per day in the US. The second wave peaked in mid-July with about 67,000 cases per day. We're now average about 49,000 cases a day and rising. How likely is a third wave in the Bay Area and in California? Well, uh, as uh, Yogi Berra once said, making projection predictions is difficult, particularly about the future. Um, but but um, I think most experts would project that we're going to have continued transmission of the virus um, in the United States in general, and, and certainly here in, in the Bay Area. There is some evidence that the numbers of infections are rising. Um, and, and so, uh, you know, this may reflect increased uh, uh, movement of people um, it may uh, reflect uh, attempts to try and get the economy opening again. Uh, we don't know if weather has any influence on this or not, but there's certainly reason to be concerned that we will see more infections in the coming months. So, so what have we learned from the second wave to help us prevent or mitigate the third wave art? Well, I think, uh, you know, of course, everyone is very frustrated and everyone wants to get back to the way life was a year ago. Um, which is quite understandable. Um, so, so I think what we have is some, some fatigue, if you will, with our prevention measures. Uh, we are re trying to reopen segments of society. Um, but I think what people need to keep in mind is that for at least the foreseeable future, uh, wearing a mask in public is an important prevention strategy. Uh, hand washing, good hygiene, reducing your number of contacts. These are relatively inexpensive and easy things for people to do, uh, even if they're going out to do their shopping or going to work. So uh, I think a lot of these measures are consistent uh, with continuing to have, if not a totally normal pre-COVID life, at least a reasonable life. Of course, some of the bigger problems are reopening schools um, and, and universities and trying to really get our educational systems and some of our economic drivers uh, working at full capacity. Okay, thanks, Art. Uh, let's direct this next question to Eva. On September 18th, the CDC cited growing evidence that the virus could be spread by aerosol only to retract it three days later, saying that it had been posted in air. Then last week, it acknowledged that aerosolized particles can stay airborne for many minutes to hours and travel more than six feet. Eva, what's the difference between aerosol and droplets? 
and what does the latest scientific evidence tell us about airborne transmission? Hi, so um, the deal with aerosol versus drop versus droplets has to do with the size of the particle and how far it will be essentially maintained in the air and how long it will be maintained in the air. Um, so generally it's like maybe less than five microns would be aerosol, but really what matters is more the functional consequence. And I think that's where there's been a lot of back and forth. So the idea of six feet is that if you're just breathing normally, then there should not be transmission in around a six foot area. And that's consistent with droplets, which would fall to the earth in, you know, fall to, fall to the ground in a six, six foot area in a, a short amount of time. Um, the the, the problem, the, not problem, but the observations are that there have been situations, for instance, in church choirs or in certain other closed areas, um, especially restaurants where there's either poor ventilation or directed airflow, um, where people further away than six feet have been infected. And so but the question is, is that aerosol or is that droplet or is that because someone is singing or yelling you know, in a closed area? And so that's, I think, where the back and forth has been. So I'm not sure we know exactly whether or not you know, a particle less than five microns has a COVID virus in it. We do know that in those conditions, in other words, being indoors with a number of people speaking very loudly or yelling or singing, projecting outwards, definitely people more than six feet away can be infected. Um, but if you're, for instance, if you're outside, that's the best way always to reduce infection. And of course, wearing a mask is, you know, hugely protective in that situation. Well, if, if a virus could be spread not only by a direct hit uh, from someone coughing or sneezing at you, uh, but by staying airborne for a few minutes to even a few hours, uh, John, what does that mean in terms of reopening? Well, it, it has implications, but it's important to go back to the understanding of what we've learned in the last 10 months with this virus in terms of its transmission. As Eva was saying, clearly the virus transmits with greatest facility if you're close to somebody, and we have this magical six feet. Um, but it, it really gives us a pretty good idea that if you're close to somebody, it's going to spread. And as Eva also said, if you're outside, the risk is much less than if you're inside. The solution to problems like that is dilution in the air. The, the question is how common does airborne transmission or aerosol transmission take place compared to droplets or within about six feet? And the answer is it's not very common. It certainly happens, the church choir that even even mentioned, the bands, the restaurant, there have been multiple episodes that have been well documented where far, far beyond six feet, something is spread. So it is of concern, but the vast majority of transmission occurs within a much narrower diameter. Again, it comes back to the basic principles that Art and Eva were talking about, and that is, the further away you are from somebody, the more air that's around you, outside better than inside, wearing a mask, all these things are gonna prevent problems. The issues come up if you're inside, like with the school, as you, as you raised, Michael, um, much more problematic. There you have to have some engineering solutions like more air exchanges, better air exchanges, et cetera. Let, let me ask this related question to Zia. Uh, a recent paper in Nature Medicine reported that about 20% of cases in Hong Kong were responsible for about 80% of transmission, while 70% of cases actually did not go on to infect somebody else. There have been many reports of super spreaders and super spreading events, most notably in South Korea, where one woman, patient 31, generated about 5,000 cases in a mega church cluster. So Zia, what causes super spreading and what can we do, what can businesses and campuses do to, uh, to, to avoid super spreading events uh, as they reopen? 
Yeah, super spreading, I think, has its roots in um, some of the factors that um, that, that uh, Art and John and Eva were, were talking about. Um, I think, you know, it's like, like any crime scene, uh, you have to think about the means, the motive, uh, and the opportunity. And so, you know, the virus, of course, has a clear motive to spread. Um, the means is that there has to be an infected person. So, you know, I think when we think about um, where, where the virus is spreading, there's one person that has to be at the root of one of these super spreading events. And I think when you think about um, where do policy solutions come in, that is all about testing. Um, testing to make sure that you have as few infected people as possible streaming into um, places where they could spread the event. Um, but that that's just the means, not the opportunity. So the opportunity is all about some of these factors that, um, that we were just talking about. So things like crowding, uh, indoor spaces with poor ventilation, um, you know, uh, uh, raised voices or singing that can uh, have the potential to either aerosolize particles or, or get particles spreading really far. Um, and so that's where I think some of these new insights um, into the disease transmission are, are really coming in. Um, and you can imagine some very creative policy solutions, um, you know, focusing on the things that really matter. So I think that, you know, as we've learned more and more about the disease, it's been more and more clear that um, fomites, for example, probably don't play as big a role as we initially thought. And yet, when you look at what um, businesses are uh, emailing you to reassure you about, it's like, oh, we clean all of the surfaces, we wipe everything down, but they're not saying anything about ventilation. Um, so where where is the public messaging about ventilation and keeping doors open and things like that? So I think the more we know about the virus, um, the more we should um, use that knowledge to focus on things that matter. Um, and also, you know, to your previous question, really admit where we don't know. Um, uh, enough about aerosolizing transmission. We saw this with masks, we saw this with aerosols. Um, there's legitimate uncertainty and I don't think we should be punishing public health agencies for um, saying that we don't know or for changing their mind uh, when we learn more. Okay. Thanks, Ian. Uh, Art, let me come back to you. Uh, unlike other universities that have reopened uh, and then have to shut down again because of outbreaks, Berkeley has managed to avoid a major outbreak. So, so what's the university doing to keep the campus safe? Sorry, uh, the university is doing quite a bit. Uh, the chancellor fairly early on made a decision that we would provide our, our instruction uh, via Zoom or via over distance. That's of course a challenge to everyone, but we're, we're trying to learn to do that as effectively as possible. Um, and, and she said we would keep to a, a low number uh, the people, the number of people on the campus. So to the frustration of researchers who need access to their labs and uh, in order to do their research, uh, the number of researchers and staff allowed on the campus has been restricted. Um, uh, but in addition, the number of students allowed to live on campus has been greatly reduced. So at the moment, we have a little under 2000 students living in dormitories um, and, um, you know, under conditions that are uh, certainly intended to keep to a minimum the possibility the transmission will occur in that setting. And, and Theodore may speak to this, but um, I think so far the evidence is uh, that, keep fingers crossed, but we've had very little in the way of transmission of the virus on the Berkeley campus. Um, we've had an occasional person who was probably infected in the community, uh, but, but since uh, the students came back to the dormitory, we've had very, very little in the way of a problem. So uh, we hope that can continue. Uh, so I would say the campus has done a good job of, of reducing uh, the opportunities for people uh, to be in crowded circumstances. Uh, and so far, it seems to be uh, keeping things in check. Great. And, and let me ask you a follow-up question, Art. Uh, that uh, the, the, the campus started uh, in the fall uh, with remote instruction, and it's really not clear uh, when are we are going to be able to get back to in-person instruction. So from your perspective, what conditions have to be met and what systems have to be put in place uh, in order for Berkeley to reopen its campus safely for some in-person instruction? Well, there is currently discussion about some pilot programs that would allow relatively small numbers of, of uh, students to be together with a faculty member, uh, primarily in outdoor spaces, which is a little easier at a place where the climate is mild. Um, uh, to see how that goes. And of course, it'll be stringently uh, uh, observed uh, 
in terms of infection uh, and, and uh, social distancing and mask wearing. Uh, the hope is that that will go well uh, and allow us to expand that to, to larger numbers. My understanding is that the current plan for the spring semester uh, is that still uh, most classes will be held online, um, but there may be more courses that are offered in person. But for people who, for whatever reason, cannot be present uh, in an in-person in course, we will still make those available to, to, to people who can only participate via Zoom or, or, or from a distance. And of course, at the same time, we also need to keep our faculty and our staff safe. Uh, so older faculty like me uh, will be encouraged to keep teaching from a distance. Younger faculty who may be at less risk and uh, you know, may be a better place to, to be uh, with a group of 15, 20 students with appropriate precautions. So, so I think it's got to be nuanced. It can't just be one size fits all. And I do very much appreciate just how thoughtful and measured uh, the, the, the campus approach to reopening this. Uh, let, let's go to, uh, uh, no, let's take some questions from our live audience. Uh, Priya, are there any questions? Um, there are a handful of questions and most of them relate to the topic that Art was just talking about, which is um, what has been the thought process about why the university decided to have the spring semester online? Um, will there be opportunities for students to participate in on campus or, or small or outdoor classes in the spring? Um, can we start by reopening the libraries? Will there be a graduation in May? So I think Art, you, you touched on a little bit of this and I, I wonder if you have any other comments to add or, or, or if others do. Um, and to those watching, I would just ask that um, you submit questions on the Facebook, UC Berkeley Facebook page. I know many of you are watching on YouTube which has comments disabled. So I, I hope that helps so Art. I, I would know, say a couple of things. I think the campus is being cautious uh, because I think the general feeling is the only thing worse um, than not bringing people back is bringing them back and having to close everything down again two or three weeks later because of some massive outbreak as a number of large state uh, universities and others have seen uh, in the past month or so. So I think that caution is probably reasonable. Um, you know, for those who are hoping that a vaccine, and I'm sure we'll come back to the vaccines uh, in, in a little bit, uh, that a vaccine is going to be our savior. Um, you know, I think it's pretty certain uh, that, that the average college student and faculty member will not have had an opportunity to be vaccinated by the middle of January. And so the notion that we'll all have been vaccinated and, and that that's going to allow the spring semester to be normal, quote unquote, is simply not in accord with the realities of when we might have large numbers of doses of vaccine. And of course, the other concern is, uh, uh, you know, we don't really know what this uh, influenza season is going to be like. Uh, there's, of course, a concern that this winter uh, we will see more uh, respiratory infections because of both flu and other uh, respiratory viruses circulating as well as COVID. Uh, and so there's a concern that, that we may be uh, flooded uh, with, with people with pneumonia and severe respiratory infections. Uh, the last thing I'll say is, you know, so far the evidence from the Southern Hemisphere uh, is that it wasn't a terribly bad flu season. Uh, maybe that's because of all the mask wearing. Uh, masks should help prevent transmission of influenza as well. So, so maybe we'll get off easy with regard to flu this winter, but it remains to be seen. Get a flu shot. Thanks, Art. Priya, other questions? Um, yeah, there's um, a couple of questions related to um, airborne transmission. So one asking us to clarify exactly what that means. Does it mean just that you can get it from, from the virus transmitting through the air or can the virus actually multiply while floating in the air? And um, a second question related, if, for, if fomites are not a major concern and airborne virus generally does not collect on our bodies and clothing, how does a large enough amount of virus collect on our hands such that hand washing is equally important as wearing a mask? I don't know, Ava or John or Art, if you'd like to take that one. I can certainly answer the first one, and that is that, um, that, no, the virus will not replicate while it's being transmitted in the air. A virus is only, essentially a virus needs a cell um, in order to be able to 
make its own proteins and replicate its own genetic material and then make more particles. And so it has to be inside an organism and it so will not replicate during the, its flight in the air. Um, I think one of the, the big issues around fomites and, and Ziad, maybe you can, or Art, anyone can mention is, is, is that it's really touching that and then getting it right into, you know, your mouth or eyes or into your body, you know, directly. And so, um, which, you know, is not like, you're not really like licking your clothes at, you know, all times of the day, whereas it's, a, as we've been told that we touch our faces like thousands of times in a day. Um, and, and so that's really when the fomites is from your hands that you don't realize directly into places where it can get into your body as opposed to being somewhere where it's not going to be accessing, you know, the, your, you know, bodily fluids, etc. cetera. So, so I, might just, I might just add one follow-up to that. Um, I certainly agree with what Eva said. Um, it, it is true that uh, people have found the virus on different types of materials. We're shown that it can persist on various types of materials, but you also need to take into account that you need to get an infectious dose. Um, and so uh, the likelihood is uh, that, that uh, we probably don't have a lot of transmission of this virus via inanimate objects in the environment. Uh, I, I, there's very little evidence of that, although theoretically, it's certainly possible. Hand washing is a very good public health measure. We do want people to wash their hands regularly. Uh, but, but, I, but I would agree with Ziad that, that, that um, all of the emphasis on decontaminating uh, surfaces and floors and walls and, and packages and the like probably is more than is really needed to keep us safe and probably not as important as wearing a mask. I'll add one quick note on hand washing, which is that um, touching an object and then touching your face, maybe a little bit less. But on the other hand, um, we often touch other people. So shaking hands and things like that. I think uh, one of the more recent super spreading events uh, at the White House actually showed uh, exactly that mechanism of transition where, where there was a lot of handshaking and hugging. And so that's another great reason to uh, keep those hands washed. Thanks, Ian. Uh, I see a question from Laurie McLean, who's a university trustee and, uh, uh, and a dear friend of the School of Public Health. Uh, Laurie asks, has the low infection rate in San Francisco's Chinatown, which is densely populated neighborhood with many people working in uh, 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 yeah, close quarters, uh, taught us anything that might help in fending off infectious illnesses in the future? Art, anyone? Well, I don't have data that would support what I'm about to say. Um, so I think it's probably a data-free zone. Mm -hmm. um, but, but, you know, I would say that um, certainly in many Asian cultures, wearing a mask is much more readily acceptable. Uh, there are entire countries where, in fact, it's almost the norm. Um, and, and so it's possible that there's better adherence to mask wearing in Chinatown. I, I haven't been to Chinatown since the beginning of the epidemic. So as I said, I don't have any data for that. But it, it's certainly possible that some of that has to do with better adherence to mask wearing. Yeah, I just spent this uh, kind of month this summer in Taiwan, and it is a cultural norm there uh, to for for mask wearing. and. That the important thing there is that that you're wearing the mask, uh, not just for yourself, but you're really wearing the mask to protect uh, each other. Uh, all right. I'd like to add one thing to that. Go ahead, John. There's an assumption made in that question that, that I don't know that necessarily true, and that is that there's a lower incidence of infection in that community. We don't really know how many people are infected in that community. But what, one thing we do know in San Francisco is, not just Chinatown, but in San Francisco, is that it has probably the lowest mortality rates in COVID of any, well, we know it's the lowest of any of the large metropolitan areas in the United States. So again, we don't know about infection and maybe there's low grade infection going on, not enough to cause disease, but maybe even enough to immunize. Let's talk about testing, and let me bring in Fyodor uh, into the conversation. Now, Fyodor, can you tell the audience, I, I love the story that, that you told me about how you and Jennifer Doutna uh, transformed the Innovative Genomic Institute from a world-class research laboratory doing you know, cutting-edge uh, research on CRISPR 
uh, into a CLIA certified clinical laboratory doing thousands of COVID tests a day. What, why, why did you do that? Um, folks, when the pandemic is behind us, um, I encourage you to uh, not just visit the campus, of course, but stop by a lovely building on the corner of um, Oxford and Hearst, which is a nonprofit called the Innovative Genomics Institute. And what does that even mean? Um, it's the house that Jennifer Doudna of CRISPR Nobel fame built. To remind you about CRISPR, and that it, it's worth 10 seconds of our joint time, this is CRISPR in living color. Um, this is Jennifer Doudna's Nobel winning, prize winning discovery. So you're saying, is this just a piece of plastic with red bits? So the actual CRISPR is, let's think about this, 100 million times smaller than this. And uh, it's a remarkable tool that allows scientists to change genetic material um, in a human being to treat their sickle cell disease or in a, in, a, in, a, in a rice plant to make it more tolerant of drought. So this is what Jennifer just won the Nobel Prize for. It's a truly planet affecting discovery. And the mission of the IGI is to use CRISPR to promote public health in a in a way that's equitable, affordable, and focuses really on communities who are disadvantaged. Um, we are not a testing lab. We are a bunch of molecular biologists doing molecular biology. You know, until uh, the nation calls, what can I say? The, the, the Bay Area called out to us. There is no way to say this other than that. In mid-March, the testing need was really dire. Um, the for-profit providers of testing were returning results in a week and clinicians told us that's pretty much useless. And in very brass tax terms, this meant that the Berkeley Fire Department could not test their firefighters after an accidental exposure, or that there were large communities uh, in Richmond, in East Oakland, in Berkeley, that had simply no way to test for SARS-CoV-2, even though they are in congregated housing and thus at enhanced risk of transmission, as my many esteemed colleagues on the call will tell you. It was getting bad, and I mean, we, we could we could have leaned back, but that's not Jennifer Doudna. She's passionate. Uh, one of her light motifs of her personality is equitable and fair access to her discoveries and the call and what what she has built. So on March 13th, she gathered the entire institute, this building on the first floor, and said, "We have to stand up and fight the pandemic. And what we are going to do is we're going to build a free resource to do testing." And honestly, folks, and I've said this before, and I'll say this again, I get goosebumps every time I remember this, because to me, seeing Jennifer do that was like Lady Liberty lifting, but not a torch, but lifting a micro pipette and calling us all to action. So at this point, um, we all sort of launched into battle because fortunately the mechanics under the testing are sort of our bread and butter. It's basically to detect the virus genetic material and we're kind of all trained to do that. But the difference between that and doing a scalable CLIA test for virus is a bit like flying a Cessna versus flying a dream, Dreamliner, right? I mean, it's a very different thing. So I really wanna, this I think where is where the beauty and the might of Berkeley, the world's greatest research university really comes into play because we had the tremendous opportunity throughout this process to partner with and rely on the wisdom, guidance and non-overlapping but essential expertise from so many including folks at the School of Public Health, many of them on the call, uh, folks at University Health Services. Um, it's really affecting to me that our Chancellor, Carol Christ, I mean, she's an English professor. She specializes in Victorian literature. She approved of this unprecedented move that UC Berkeley is going to build a CLIA test to test the vulnerable uh, within about five minutes of hearing about this idea. So a lot of teamwork and a lot of support from the community and the university. But here we are seven months into the pandemic, where a bunch of, you know, sort of academics sitting in their ivory tower have pretty much dismantled that ivory tower and are testing uh, daily folks across the East Bay and, and on campus. Because as I said at the beginning, our city, our neighborhood, um, the, the state called out to us and we, we stood up as best as we could while being led by our newest Nobel laureate, Jennifer Dunn. That, that story just can, makes me just truly proud to be blue and gold. Um, now, uh, and especially considering the fact that, that you've not only been testing on the Berkeley campus, but also for many Bay Area communities, especially uh, uh, among our most vulnerable populations. So, so what, what are you finding with all the testing that you're doing? Yeah. You know, folks, come back to campus and uh, at the top of the hour, you will hear the beautiful Ber Berkeley campanile ringing its bells. 
And I will admit, I've, I've always thought of this as what it makes me so happy, except over the pandemic, I often think about the great poem by the English poet John Donne, in which he says, never ask for whom the bell tolls because it tolls for thee. Um, the Berkeley campus is not isolated from the community, it is part of it. And uh, the virus, frankly, again, I'm not a trained virologist like many, so many folks who are an infectious disease doctor, but uh, last I heard, the virus does not discriminate. Our health system, I am sorry to say, our healthcare provider system does. There is no way to sugarcoat this. Um, there is a lot of structural racism in our society as far as providing healthcare. And it breaks my heart to wake up daily and pull up on my screen the latest testing numbers from around the East Bay. And we part partner with folks uh, who test all the way as north as, as, as the Iron Triangle of Richmond and all the way south is Fremont and East Oakland, and to see a massive disparity and the disproportionate impact that SARS-CoV-2 has on brown and black communities, the socioeconomically disadvantaged folks experiencing homelessness. So on the one hand, my, my heart beats, just as Michael Lou just said, blue and gold proud that we are providing free testing to those folks. But there is also a heavy dose of realism in the sense that we are just a nonprofit on one campus of one great research university. But I think if there is a lesson that we all as a nation, as a state, as a city, as a community should take away from this is the structural disparities and the availability of healthcare are glaring. And sort of at baseline where people just drive to work and have their meals and watch their shows, that might not be as poignant until you get to a setting where there is a community seven miles away from our campus where 15%, one five percent of the folks who just woke up to get tested have SARS-CoV-2. This is not sustainable. We have to do something. So while we will persevere, we will endure through the pandemic and we will provide as much testing as we can, I think this is a challenge to all of us. How do we as a society remedy this grave ill? Thank you. Let me ask uh, Zia a follow-up question. As uh, Fedor just said, you know, Richmond is what, seven miles from Berkeley campus. Zia, why are there such stark disparities uh, in COVID cases and what can we do about them? I think, you know, Fyodor uh, started this, um, this conversation and, and, and I think I'll just add a couple things to what he said. I think all of the factors that we know favor transmission are just, very unequally distributed geographically, um, socioeconomically. Um, people who work as essential workers um, are much more likely to be exposed to the virus um, in the course of their job. People who live in crowded home communities are just more likely to be um, infected in the workplace as well as outside. So all of the factors that we know are linked to um, higher risk of transmission are just much more common. Um, so that's one channel. The second channel is uh, as Fyodor was mentioning, um, just huge disparities in, in access to healthcare. And on that note, I'd say that, you know, we, we can see the number of cases in, in Richmond or, or you know, in, in communities like it throughout the country, but th that number should be higher um, because people don't have access to testing. Um, and, and we actually don't even count all of the cases that we should be counting. And that propagates through um, to the way we allocate our, our federal aid money. Um, we never see the suffering of people who don't have access to the system and never get counted. Um, and so that disparity um, in data and access to healthcare and knowing that you're infected and being able to take effective measures to protect yourself, that propagates through the system and creates a vicious cycle um, where we never see that suffering. And so we never um, allocate the resources that we need to, um, to alleviate it. Thank you. Fedor, uh, here's a question. What's the difference between PCR antigen and antibody testing for COVID-19? And what do they tell you? So, you know, there has to be, as the famous song goes, silver lining in every cloud. And I suppose um, as tragic as the pandemic is truly so, uh, the one tiny bit of silver lining is I, as a molecular biologist, gets to talk to our community about the polymerase chain reaction. And everybody will find it interesting because it's just so directly relevant. Um, 
So I'm going to limit my professorial instincts and give everyone a 15 minute lecture and try to limit this to just three statements. <clears throat> Whatever the test, PCR, antigen, antibody, there is no such thing as a perfect test. A test that 100% of the time with a 100% accuracy will say you have the virus or you don't, or you have been exposed to it or you haven't. But you know, public health, as may, our many, my many esteemed colleagues will tell you, is the art of the possible. And sometimes the art of the possible can be really powerful. Um, there are two ways to detect whether or not you currently have the virus. Um, the first one is better, and that's the one we do. It is to ask whether or not you have the virus's genetic material. Now, <clears throat> um, if you drop me an email after the pandemic is over, I will gladly give you a 30 minute lecture on why the virus, specifically SARS-CoV-2 is a bit of a challenge. It has to do with the fact that its genetic material is RNA, not DNA, and RNA is chemically, I don't want, I don't want to destroy your will to live. But the bottom line is, the challenges with PCR testing, even the best ones, and we flatter ourselves into thinking that we have one of the most sensitive, so tell somebody they're positive if they are, and specific, so never give, never lie to people. Like, they don't have the virus, they don't have the virus. Even though we have one of the most sensitive and specific ones, it is still imperfect. And, and for what it's worth, uh, here is a molecular biologist uh, speaking about public health. Do not make assumptions based on results of tests. I think ultimately foundational common sense of maintaining elementary public health practices at the end of the day are essential and the centerpiece of what you should be doing on, on your daily basis. Having said that, what's a PCR test? Okay, you uh, have a, a clinician uh, sticks a stick up your nose, which looks like a Q-tip, or you spit into a tube, or pretty much those are the two sort of best ways to test. And then that tube arrives in a lab here, the doors get closed, and then specialized scientists prepare all the genetic material they can find and simply ask using the polymerase chain reaction and earlier Nobel winning discovery uh, to ask, does it have the virus material or it does not? The, the, briefly, the caveats are different parts of the body we now know produce different amounts of virus depending on the window of time when you're infected. And the other issue is um, it's very hard to tell from that test whether you are a danger or not, like objectively, oh my God, you have very little virus, go ahead and be happy. That's just unfortunately not how it works. And last but not least, this also means that this, this PCR test has a known false negative rate. And what that means in English is it can tell somebody they don't have the virus even though they do. And this is where folks like Zia Obermeyer and other folks, Ava Harris and many other folks on the call have developed very sophisticated scientific foundations for how often do you test even if the test is imperfect. Okay, the two others I can describe much quicker because they're frankly less interesting. The antigen test basically asks, do you have the virus protein? It is similar to the test you currently get for the flu. Uh, in brief, if you can get the PCR test, get it. The antigen test is interesting because it's quick. It's a lot less interesting because it's neither very sensitive nor very specific. Don't get me wrong. It's the art of the positive, of the possible. If you can have a test, it's better than nothing, but a PCR test is better. And finally, the famous antibody test, which is, have you had the virus? One key point, if you have been exposed in the past 24 hours or you think so, do not get that test. Experiments have shown here at UC Berkeley by Patrick Zhu and UCSF by Alex Marson that it takes a formidable amount of time for a person to develop those little biological machines to fight the infection, antibodies in their bloodstream. Furthermore, different people respond differently. Having said that, if you get tested for antibodies and if you have evidence of those in your bloodstream, this means you have been infected with the virus. Now, I am neither an infectious disease doctor nor a public health professional, so I will not even try to answer the question of whether that means that you're now safe from being infected again, because that is not my area of immediate technical expertise. All right, well, let, let me pick a debate here. So, so recently, Michael Mina at Harvard suggests that we need a new testing paradigm in this country. That for surveillance testing, instead of doing PCRs, we should just be doing these like cheap, frequent, rapid antigen testing on everyone. Uh, and that you're making up for lower sensitivity uh, with higher frequency of testing. Uh, what, what do you all think of, of that? Maybe we'll start with you, Art. Yes, I'm familiar with, with that. A possible approach. Uh, you know, I think what he envisions 
is that we would each have a little bottle of strips at home. Um, the strip might cost a dollar. Um, and I test myself and my children every morning to see whether I can go to work or take my children to school. Um, and, and despite the fact that those individual strips are not nearly as sensitive as what Fyodor is talking about with PCR, if I test myself every day, uh, the frequency of testing more than makes up for the lack of sensitivity. And so in theory, that's a, you know, that, that could be a useful strategy. I would just point out, however, uh, if you do the math of a dollar a strip per person per day in the United States, it's a non-trivial investment of billion, billions of dollars to buy all those strips and distribute them, uh, to get people to use them and in, interpret them and, and, and behave accordingly. So it's, it's not a it's not a minor thing to envision a program like that. And of course, at the moment, nobody is producing billions of these strips. So, um, you know, it's an interesting theory. Uh, I suspect we'll never actually get around to seeing how well it works for a variety of reasons, but I understand the concept. John, you wanna weigh in on this? Yeah, I do. <laughs> uh, I, agree, I agree with what, what Art said and what Fedor said. Um, we need, we, need, we need data, we need to do the experiments to see if it's gonna work. And actually those experiments are being done right now. Um, not quite with the dollar a day strips, but they're being done in the Pac-12 uh, with football players. They're doing them six times a week on the football players every day, except, well, six out of the seven days. And um, they're collecting that data and they're gonna see if it works. Theoretically, it should, all the modeling suggests that it should work. You'll get the results in 15 minutes as opposed to PCR, which takes you know, 24, 48 hours to get back. So um, if the modeling is correct, um, it, may, uh, it, may, it may be beneficial, at least in that setting. Um, scaling that up to the levels that Art's talking about is, uh, is a prodigious amount of money and uh, requires behavioral change, which Americans seem to be resistant to. Uh, but that said, we're already spending a prodigious amount of money trying to control this uh, pandemic in many ways that aren't working. So um, I don't think the money is the absolute obstacle here. It's, it's the scaling up to do it. Uh, but the biggest obstacle right now is that we don't have the data to prove that it works. We know it works in theory, but we don't know if it's going to work in practice. So John, I am curious. The, the NFL seems to be canceling a lot of games lately. Uh, how often are they testing NFL players? It's unclear. Uh, they were, I know they were testing them every other day for a while. I think they may be testing them a little less frequently now. It's clearly not working. The only, the only sport situation where it's working was the, with the NBA, but that was because of, not so much because of the testing, but because of the bubbles that they kept the players in. I have one, um, one, one thought on this, and I think maybe I'll, I'll, I'll take a slightly different um, view from, from Art and John, even though I agree with everything they said. Um, there's one great thing about that plan, which is that it's a plan. <laughs> uh, somebody has a plan <laughs> and we can actually think about implementing it. Um, there was a, an article that came out today uh, um, written by Larry Summers and David Cutler uh, at Harvard who estimate that over the next year, the direct um, cost of the COVID pandemic is about $8 trillion. The, the, the cost in terms of years of life lost is another $8 trillion. And so I think that you know, the, the cost um, benefit analysis of basically doing anything right now is so clearly in favor um, of, of rolling out solutions that I, I, I think this is a good plan. There are many other good plans, um, but we need a plan and we need some leadership and, and some technical way to push this forward. Um, and I'd say that actually like I had one, that maybe my one point of disagreement on the NFL point is that I actually think that I would consider the NFL a success story, um, not as much of a success story as the NBA, but they are diagnosing cases, they're canceling games. And I actually think that even if you looked at the, um, the White House uh, testing strategy, which many people would consider as a failure, um, the counterfactual is no testing at all. And so from that point of view, we've tested people, we've diagnosed them, we've, we've actually cut down on transmission. And so I actually view this as a, as a clear positive and we should be doing that as well as a bunch of other things to scale up testing. So, so Zia, let, let me ask you a follow-up question. So, so uh, it, instead of uh, testing everyone every day, uh, uh, which could be 
quite costly and unsustainable in the long run, uh, especially if you have to test a scale uh, or if you know, or, or doing kind of random testing in population, which is, would be like kind of looking for a needle in a haystack. Uh, are there ways that, that we can leverage AI and machine learning uh, to do smarter testing, to target testing? I'm, I'm so pleased that you asked, Michael. Uh, yes, I, I hope so. And this is something, uh, an area where I've learned an enormous amount from, from Theodore and, and his colleagues uh, at IGI. Um, there's an old idea uh, in public health um, around pooled testing. So this is basically if all of us on this panel, um, uh, we, we spit in a tube where we got a, a little swab from our noses and we combine those specimens into one um, little, uh, little dish, we could test that pool and if all of us are negative, then that test is gonna come back negative. Um, and if one of us is positive, that test is gonna come back positive. But if it's negative, we've tested all of us with just one test. Um, and so with some colleagues uh, at Berkeley, um, at Haas, the business school, um, we had this idea for ways to apply data science um, and predictive tools from machine learning to dramatically scale up the efficiency of that approach to testing. And that works particularly well when you're doing frequent testing. So if all of us were being tested, not just today, but um, every day for a week or even every week, we would actually drive the cost down um, to, to around the cost of these antigen strips, but while benefiting from some of the properties of PCR that Fyodor was, was talking about. Um, and so we're currently trying to work with um, uh, some assisted living facilities, uh, even some companies um, to just get this piloted and get this out and tested, but I think, um, but I think if it becomes successful, I think that becomes just another strategy in this arsenal of strategies that we need to dramatically scale up testing to the point where, if any of us wants to get tested at any time, we can get it. Um, and asymptomatic people are also being tested with some frequency. Um, the test doesn't have to be perfect; uh, it just has to be perfect enough to um, drive down the rate of transmission by telling people that they're positive and taking the quarantine measures uh, and, and, and getting them to the hospital when they need it. And, and, and Peter, uh, let me get back to you on, on this one. Uh, I, I had heard that Jennifer and others uh, have been looking at the use of CRISPR uh, to support okay, rapid testing, uh, rapid diagnostics. Uh, can you talk a little bit about that and what's the status of uh, okay, point of care testing using CRISPR? Um, I can talk about it at great length because, you know, finally we're back on my home turf, which is this baby. <laughs> um, folks, I told you that Jennifer's discovery opened um, the planet to the age of making, being able to make precise genetic changes in the cell, in the blood cells of a person who has a genetic disease or to make rice better survive uh, a warming planet. So there is no way to say it, except to say it, CRISPR has another side, which has nothing to do uh, with changing DNA and instead has to do with being, being able to detect, like find, minute amounts of genetic material of any sort. And how could that possibly be? Well, at the end of the day, this thing is a search and destroy engine. And so what it does is it carries in it a little uh, red strip, um, which has a little genetic uh, barcode. And it runs around looking for a match. And the match in this case is this blue DNA. And once the match is found, CRISPR gets rid of it. And that can be repurposed to repair a genetic mutation, but that can also be repurposed to detect a very rare molecule of a virus. Why? So first of all, that has been done and it works. Uh, why are people doing this? First, um, because it's field deployable. Right now, if you want to test for SARS-CoV-2, you do this thing that as Aziad and others have said, but then that travels to this lab on the first floor and there's like $2 million worth of equipment and 12 people moving around very sophisticated stuff. It's expensive. Um, and you obviously have to ship the specimen to the, to the lab. Now imagine a happy future, fall 2021, where, you know, pub public spaces are open, you know, you can go to the film theater and at the door, 
uh, you get a strip, this is back to Ziad's, Ziad's vision, and you put that in your mouth and then you drop it into a thing. And five minutes later, the, 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 the ticket taker goes, yeah, you're in, you're virus free. So how could that be? Well, that requires something that doesn't need specialized equipment. That's CRISPR. That's fast. That's CRISPR. And that's cheap. I haven't brought that up. That's CRISPR. So why isn't it everywhere? Um, time. The pandemic hit very hard. And what we had time to do and the world had time to do is build on what we know how to do, which is uh, the good old school PCR. However, we happen to be the house that Jennifer Doudna built, the house of CRISPR. And it happens to be the case that CRISPR is, can be repurposed. So let's just say that both the IGI, the Innovative Genomics Institute here at Cal, and other places, including for-profit entities, are, are running, you know, frankly, like the coyote after the roadrunner to get a CRISPR test built, that's done, pressure tested, that's being done. And then will come the famous challenge of the last mile, which is a term for, I think, telecommunications. How do you get the cell phone service into the proverbial middle of nowhere where people might need it? So the challenge of the last mile of building enough of these tests to, uh, to cover a reasonable sized community and then distributing it in an equitable manner. This goes back to the point that Z had made. That will be sort of, um, that will be the big one. Here's the good news. At least we know now from data that my colleagues here at the IGI um, and at Berkeley, Dan Fletcher, Melanie Ott at the Gladstone, again, Jennifer Doudna here at the IGI, there is enough of a there there to have clear eyed hope, which is not just you know dreaming, but pragmatics, that we, have, we will have an ultra fast, affordable, field deployable CRISPR test. Um, we have one now already, it'll be even faster how deployable it will be in the real world that is the pragmatic reality of how the pandemic plays itself out in our nation. I think only the future will tell. Great, thank you. Well, we, we talked about testing. Let, let's talk a little bit about tracing. And Art, you know, we all been hearing a lot lately about contact tracing as related to the outbreak at the White House. What's actually involved in doing contact tracing? Well, contact tracing is a rather old public health strategy. Uh, it's mostly been deployed in the context of tuberculosis or sexually transmitted infections. And the basic notion is, uh, if I diagnose you with an infection, I, I ask you about who you've been in contact with, and then I go and seek them out and I ask them some questions and I maybe even test them or treat them uh, in order to, to reduce spread of infection in the community. Um, and so that's what contact tracing is. Uh, and in theory, uh, it, it should help reduce spread of an infection like, like COVID or uh, SARS-CoV-2. You know, the, the problem, we have a number of problems doing it in the real world. And people are trying to use apps, for example, to, to improve this process. But one of the problems is uh, that, that not everyone, when they get a call uh, from a strange person, uh, are necessarily willing to take the call or answer questions candidly or, or accurately. Uh, I, I myself often hang up when I get a call from someone I don't know uh, as possible spam. Uh, so building trust with people and getting them to, to tell you information is uh, an important part of this. It's not just finding someone and asking them questions. Uh, they need to trust you. Um, if it turns out that they're, that they're going to be tested, um, uh, people are concerned whether they'll end up being isolated, uh, how they'll manage that, how they'll be supported uh, if they end up being isolated by public health. So there are a lot of concerns people have when you call them up as part of this process. But one of the things we learned in our Berkeley Safe Campus Initiative is that a certain age group actually doesn't answer phone calls. Uh, if you text them, that might work, but phones, forget it, right? I may, you know, I may have a cell phone I use, but a lot of younger people rely entirely on text messaging. Uh, you know, the other problem fundamentally is one of scale. And, and so if you have five cases of TB a year in, in a city, uh, tracing all their contacts is doable. Uh, if you have 100 cases of gonorrhea a year in a, in a city, tracing all their sexual contacts in theory is plausible. But if we have 50,000 cases newly diagnosed across the country of COVID and each of them has half a dozen contacts, that's an, a, a, a heavy lift 
in terms of the contact tracing. And what we've seen in many cities, at least so far, is it's completely overwhelmed the capacity of health departments uh, to go out and trace all the contacts of all the people who are testing positive. So in theory, uh, it, it, it can be beneficial. And, and Ziad may uh, uh, you know, uh, help me understand how we can do it better, but, it, but it's proving to be a challenge. Yeah, and that, that's why countries across the world have been leveraging technology uh, to facilitate digital contact tracing. So, so let me ask you uh, this question, Zia. Now, countries like China, South Korea, UK have taken this uh, a centralized public health first approach, whereas countries like Australia, Singapore, and Germany have taken a more decentralized privacy first approach. Where's the US? What is the US doing around contact tracing uh, and some, uh, and what are the, the advantages and limitations of our approach? Um, well, uh, I'll start with the limitations uh, since I don't see many advantages uh, of our approach at all. I, I think that um, we started way too late. Um, contract tracing in this country started happening after a critical number of cases had been passed. And as Art mentioned, that generates just an insurmountable amount of work for the people who are doing contact tracing. Um, it's easy when you uh, have a coherent national policy to, to nip these cases in the bud early. Um, you know, After it gets out of hand, it becomes really hard to trace because everyone is a contact of everyone. Um, and so you know, I, can, I can understand the appeal of turning to some of these digital um, technologies, both to manage that task better and also um, to, to compensate for just the massive disarray that our contact tracing technology um, uh, is, is, is currently in, uh, largely because it involves like fax machines and paper forms that are being filled out by hand. So there's an enormous appeal to bringing technology into this. Um, I think the problem is that technology can't solve many of the problems that aren't brought up. So um, technology won't be able to solve the fact that most people have enormous mistrust um, of anyone who's trying to uh, track their movements on their phone, um, you know, especially when the government is, is involved and especially when uh, infectious diseases are involved. You know, I, I think we often turn to technology uh, to solve some of these deep um, political polarizing problems. And as we know from many other settings, uh, you know, like, like Facebook, um, technology can't really solve those problems. Uh, it can certainly make them worse, uh, but, but it, it can't often solve them. Uh, let's uh, go to that. Uh, go to our live audience. Priya, any questions from our live audience? Yep, many questions, Michael. Um, one comment that I had been planning to read uh, was about our participation in Pac-12 football, and I think that we did touch on that a little bit. Um, but some concerns that folks have raised about the um, lack of sensitivity of antigen tests relative to PCR tests and um, looking for comments from the panel about whether we should indeed be participating in Pac-12 football. And if so, should we be PCR testing our athletes? Um, maybe I'll read just a couple more uh, questions and then we can um, tackle a few of them together. So um, another question is sort of is more practical. What is our recommendation to folks who are thinking about traveling to see loved ones? Is that safe and, and what advice would we give them? Um, and then finally, um, are we concerned about the flu and COVID interacting with each other? Are there compounding effects or conversely, do viruses ever compete with each other so that being infected with COVID makes it harder for the flu to infect you? Um, and I'll stop there. There are many other questions if we have. Them. John, uh, you want to take these questions? Sure. As long as you uh, list them for me. Um, the Pac-12. Pac-12, Pac right. So the, the, um, on August 10th, the Medical Advisory Committee for the PAC-12 advised the PAC-12 not to uh, play basketball or football because they were high-risk sports, uh, at least until January 1st, and would reevaluate that date as the date approached. Um, about two weeks ago, two or three weeks ago, the PAC-12 changed, Medical Advisory Committee changed its position let me give you a little background. The, ba the decision was based primarily upon the fact that um, there was an, in August there was a lot of a lot of cases going on, 
uh, a tremendous amount of cases in, in our community and most of the communities where the Pac-12 uh, uh, games occur, universities are. Um, the second was that there was no good testing available uh, to really assure that players wouldn't be on the field or to give a, a fairly good assurance that players wouldn't be on the field or practicing with COVID. Uh, and the third was that there would be, uh, there was concern about cardiac manifestations of COVID. That came from a, 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 some, a, some uh, papers published in the spring that uh, suggested there might be cardiac complications after COVID infection. Then in, in uh, July, there was a large, a large group of uh, patients published from uh, Germany that raised the specter of really serious problems could occur in a lot of people. Um, and then there was uh, Ohio State uh, athletes, most of which were football players, and several of those players had evidence of inflammation of their heart associated with COVID. Um, so th that, that was uh, in August, uh, we were concerned about the heart, we were concerned about no testing, and we were concerned that there were an awful lot of cases in the community. Um, the subsequent meeting, um, they changed the PAC-12 advisory committee, uh, changed its opinion because the number of cases for most of the cities where the universities of the PAC-12 are, uh, the numbers had dramatically declined, like in the Bay Area, Southern California especially, UCLA and USC, um, that the cardiologists, uh, sports cardiologists around the country who had put an awful lot of work into trying to understand the cardiac manifestations of uh, COVID uh, felt that the issues had been quote overblown. And the third was the, this uh, antigen testing that's now available on a daily basis. So I'm not gonna give you, I'm not gonna tell you how people voted on that. And the advisory committee, I will tell you that the majority of people uh, voted to go ahead with basketball and football. Um, if you look at those three parameters uh, very quickly, one is it is absolutely true that in almost all the cities and communities where the universities are, the numbers are way down from where they were. Um, in reference to the heart, we have the opinions of very good cardiologists who have been studying this as long as they can, which is less than 10 months, who feel that it's not that the issue is overblown. I will put into quotes, feel. Um, the third is that we have testing and we've already talked about the fact that um, uh, it's a very, on, on paper, it sounds very good. Uh, the modeling seems to work. Um, it's not been proven to work. So that's where we are. And can you just uh, also quickly address uh, why it's especially important to get the flu shot this year? Yeah, it's, it, Art already said it. And everybody ought to be saying it. It's it's critically important. Um, if we have if we have a bad season with influenza, forty thousand, sixty thousand people die, several hundred thousand hospitalized on an average season. If we have an average season, and you add that on top of COVID, which we know loves the winter and it does very well in the winter, we will exceed the capacity of many hospitals in this country to care for people. You know, I mentioned earlier that San Francisco has the lowest mortality rate of any large metropolitan area. One reason for that is the beds available for patients with COVID were never exceeded. Not only weren't they exceeded, we had plenty of healthcare workers in beds for patients with COVID. We could care for them. Look at New York City at, the, at a similar time when they had patients in the hallways. When, when people were so strung out because there weren't enough healthcare workers to care for them, mortality rates were much higher. That's what we could see if we have a terrible, influ if we have an average influenza season, average influenza season on top of what we anticipate to happen with COVID. Get your flu shot. 50% on average of people won't get sick if they get the flu shot. That will make a major dent in keeping beds open for people who really need them for influenza or for COVID. Thanks, John. Let, let's talk about vaccine and therapeutics. Art, when are we gonna get a vaccine? Um, so first, let me just quickly respond to the one question John didn't answer, which is flying to see your relatives, this is an area John and I don't totally agree on. 
he says, I live too close to the edge, but I have a seven week old uh, grandchild and a six week old grandchild in Denver and Washington. And I have flown to Washington and I'm currently in Denver um, and I'll be going to Washington again. So uh, I think people should understand that the air on airplanes uh, is much better handled than the air in virtually any public building they go into with air exchanges and the like. Uh, that there's the possibility that there's been transmission on one flight uh, that, that's known of, uh, that I know of anyway. But I actually think being in an airplane is relatively safe compared to a lot of the things that people are doing. Um, and that if you're good about wearing a mask and, and your hand hygiene, um, you can actually fly relatively safely. But I know John doesn't totally agree with me. And when they did a survey of leading public health experts, uh, there was a, quite a spectrum of who was willing to fly and who wasn't willing to fly. So I'm pretty much at one end of that spectrum. And John, I think, is a little more to the middle or the other end of the spectrum. But um, you have good reasons to fly. Oh, well, so far, so good. Um, uh, you, you know, everyone who reads the newspapers knows that there are many vaccines under development. Uh, there are at least uh, eight or 10 in, in advanced clinical trials around the world. Um, including several uh, here in the United States. Uh, and, and you're hearing a lot of political uh, discussion about having a vaccine available by early November, an interesting choice of dates. Um, uh, but, but, but I, I, you know, I, I was just on a National Academy committee making recommendations about uh, who should get priority for a COVID vaccine once it's available. And I have to tell you, I think uh, that under the very best of circumstances, uh, we might have limited numbers of doses for the highest priority people in relatively small numbers uh, by the end of December, early January. So the notion that we would have enough vaccine for everyone in the United States who wants it, uh, I think that's simply not going to happen before the middle of 2021. Let, let me follow up on what you just said. Yeah, you are uh, kind of working with the National Academy of medicine committee uh, that's been charged with kind of making recommendations on equitable and effective distribution of vaccines. So, so um, just from your perspective, who should get the vaccine first and how do you make sure that vaccines doesn't just go to the, the, the rich and the powerful first? Well, in theory, uh, your tax dollars have already paid for all the vaccine for the United States you know, through an investment of billions of dollars in advanced purchase. So in theory, we, we already all have access uh, to the vaccine. There's still a question about the administration costs, which we recommended should also be paid for out of tax dollars so that nobody has to pay to get the shot uh, or the shots. That's still up in the air somewhat. But, but uh, you know, I think our committee, like a number of other groups that have thought about this, um, have, have given first priority to people at very high risk in healthcare settings. And that includes not just the doctors and nurses, but it includes the respiratory therapists, the physical therapists, the people who change the beds and clean the rooms and do the laundry. Um, because even with personal protective equipment, they're still on the front lines and we're still seeing quite a few infections in, in, in uh, frontline healthcare workers. Uh, you know, we, we gave a very high priority to people working in nursing homes and long-term care facilities. And, and so you can read the report. Um, but, but, you know, the problem is that fundamentally, uh, the numbers of doses will arrive incrementally, you know, maybe 5 million doses this month or 10 million doses this month. So even with those recommendations, states and counties are really going to be challenged to figure out how to distribute the vaccine. And who should get priority for the first batch, for the second batch, et cetera. And that all assumes, of course, that one or more of these vaccines is, uh, proves to be safe and effective, which I think they will. Um, but there was an interesting piece in the New York Times today pointing out that first vaccines may be OK, um, maybe not as good as ones that come six months later. Uh, and then it's going to be a really interesting question of how to deal with the fact that we have some vaccines that are better than others. Hmm. Let's uh, talk about basic science and, and let me Tim, bring Eva back to the conversation. Eva, how does the vaccine actually work? Uh, and can you talk about the different types of vaccines that are under development right now? Yeah, sure. So um, vaccines work by stimulating your immune response to 
uh, protect you against a actual encounter with the pathogen in real life. And so we have different arms of our immune response. You've probably heard of antibodies um, and those are made by B cells and uh, they uh, I recognize the pathogen and have various ways of inactivating it or getting rid of it. Um, and then there's also the T cells, which are specific um, in, to the pathogen as well and have a different mode of uh, destroying the, the pathogen and infected cells in particular. And so um, the way a vaccine, so there's multiple different platforms that are being developed right now. In fact, there's about 150 vaccines that are currently in various stages of development. Um, there's a, an amazing number that are already in clinical trials, meaning being tested in humans, about 44, in fact. And so, um, and we'll talk about, I think, in a moment what the different phases are. But first, let me just tell you what kinds of vaccines are being developed. Um, so there's the kind of standard, which are called subunit or recombinant uh, protein vaccines. And those are directed, essentially, those are the spike protein. So the virus um, has little spikes around it, which is actually while well, it's called corona as a crown, um, spikes around the virus. And uh, so if you can just take that spike protein and introduce it into a person, of course, it's not infective because it's just a protein, but your response, the B cells and the antibodies will then recognize that protein and you'll have um, the ability to ramp that up when you get a real infection and suddenly you'll have antibodies that will attack the virus and block that spike protein from being able to interact with a receptor on your cells so that you block infection, okay? So that's a subunit vaccine directed mostly to the spike protein. And that's a pretty classic one. Another classic approach is to just inactivate the virus. So you just take it and you kill it. So it's not gonna infect someone because it's dead. And then you use that as material to in, in be part of a vaccine formulation. And that will then create an immune response which will protect you against the natural infection. Um, there are others which are called vectored vaccines. So these would be um, in essentially an adenovirus or some, or, or which is the standard one that's being used, which is a kind of a, just an a inactivated virus of something else, which is essentially used as a vehicle on which you can have that spike protein, for instance. Um, there's also live attenuated vaccines, which are essentially uh, a virus which is not dead, but it's dramatically um, in, like disabled. Um, and that will also engender a good immune response. And then there are what are called genetic vaccines, which are either DNA or in this case, RNA vaccines. Um, and those can be made very rapidly with the genetic material, um, which will code for then the proteins of that virus. So like you can have an, an RNA, which will then code for the, the protein of the spike. And so that's very easy to make. Um, and you don't have to go through making large quantities of a virus and inactivating it. You can just make that little genetic material and boom. And that's why some of the vaccines have gone very quickly. So those are the different kinds of vaccines and different platforms that are being developed currently for, for COVID-19. And, and you were mentioning earlier there, there are these different phases exactly. of, uh, of okay, vaccine trials. Can, can you just talk about the, the, those uh, okay. Phase one, phase two, phase three? Yeah, this is really important. So when um, the initial stages of just uh, coming up with the, the idea and then making the very first um, tests are gonna be called preclinical development, including also animal testing, then it's gonna come to what's called clinical development. A phase one trial is good, it has a certain number um, dozens of people um, and that are going to be volunteers and they're gonna receive um, the vaccine as just a test for the safety. Um, just to see if it's too re reactogenic or, I mean, and none of this is going to like kill somebody. It's just to see whether, you know, there's too much of a reaction or if it hurts too much at the injection site or something like that. But those are evaluating just the safety in a very small number of people. Um, and then you're going to have the next, which is called a phase two. Um, a phase two trial is where you have maybe hundreds. And this is where you'll have maybe children, well, it'll start with adults and then it'll gradually, what's called de-escalation, go down into children because you want children to be able to be, to receive the vaccine, but you need to then test it. And you want to see whether they have a good immune response. Remember how the whole vaccine, the point of vaccine is to have a good immune response. And so um, a phase two is testing what's called the immunogenicity. So the ability to raise a good immune response. Um, then the phase three is really critical because that's where we measure the efficacy, meaning does the vaccine work? And in order to do this, generally there'll be maybe five to up to 30,000 um, 
volunteers, which are, is what's currently going on. There's up to like number of different phase three trials. In fact, there's 11 phase three trials going on right now. Um, and each one has up to 30,000 people. And what happens is they'll be vaccinated and you'll have the people vaccinated and then you'll have people with what's called a placebo. Which do which have something which looks like which people think they have a vaccine, but they actually um, it's not the vaccine, so that you can really compare. Uh, and then they go out into the world and may or may not be infected in real life. And then you see who's protected, the, those who had the vaccine versus those who had the placebo. And that's very important because also with much larger numbers, you might also see if there's any kind of a safety signal. You'll see it there. Uh, let's see. Now, uh, you may have answered this already, Kaiva, but, but it took the world about four years to get a SARS vaccine to phase one. And yet this time around, it only took five days to decode the SARS-CoV-2 and only 60 days to get to phase one. What, what technological advances is possible? Yeah, well, really, it's not only the technological advances, it's also like global uh, communication and sharing. Um, but one of the, the, the really important um, aspects was very, very quickly getting the genetic material for like isolating the virus, understanding what virus was causing the in this, the epidemic at that point before it became a pandemic. And then um, very quickly sequencing and then disseminating that sequence out. So the, the Chinese released, who initially sequenced the virus, released that, that sequence to the world. And so that made it very quickly able to be characterized in, in many different groups to start working on it immediately. Um, and so for instance, uh, if you use, for instance, this mRNA vaccine, as I mentioned, you don't actually need to go through a long process of growing up the virus, inactivating it, testing the inactivation. You can just quickly make the RNA or DNA, and that allowed Moderna, for instance, and some others that are using um, the, an RNA-based vaccine, NIH and others, to actually have a vaccine very, very quickly um, into phase one. Um, and it's because of these different technological platforms and as I mentioned, the sequencing and then the sharing of that sequence. And John, what's the latest on kind of what works and what doesn't in terms of treatment of COVID-19? And specifically, what do we know about the safety and efficacy of the cocktail of remdesivir, dexamethasone, and the Regeneron uh, monoclonal antibodies that the president uh, received? Yeah, here's what we know. Um, Here's the science behind what we know about the cocktail of those three drugs together. Nothing, absolutely nothing. Um, the, the, um, the theory behind it uh, in terms of the monoclonal antibodies is that uh, if given early, theoretically it should help. Um, in biology, we all know that uh, lots of things make sense but aren't true. So it will be very interesting to see if they actually do help um, the way to find that out is to do double blinded control studies, which um, we don't have yet. In terms of dexamethasone, we do have control studies that have been blinded, and it does work for a selected group of people, very sick on continuous oxygen, either by nasal cannula or re non rebreathing mask or by a ventilator. Um, it does reduce mortality modestly, but it does reduce mortality. So it is, it is a um, it is helpful in that group of people. And in, with remdesivir, it's an antiviral agent. And if given, um, it's been studied in sicker people, that is hospitalized people, because it's given intravenously, and it has been sh shown to shorten duration of hospital stay from 15 to 11 days. There are ongoing studies now combining remdesivir with uh, monoclonal antibodies. There are studies using inhalation uh, remdesivir see if it can be given earlier in the course where theoretically it would make more sense to give it early, an antiviral, give it early to stop the replication. We don't know the, any of the data about that. So we have one drug that has been proven to modestly shorten mortality, uh, reduce mortality rates, and one drug that has been uh, demonstrated, proven to um, reduce hospital stay, and uh, one drug that has been given to 275 276 people now, that is the monoclonal antibody. Um, and that's what we know. Okay. Thank you. Uh, let's uh, spend the last 10 minutes okay, reimagining uh, the post-pandemic world. The novelist Arundhati Roy 
writes that historically pandemics have forced humans to break with the past and imagine their world anew. So, so, so Zia, let me ask you this question. Uh, this is from our alum, Michael Byrd, who's a former president of the American Public Health Association. What have we learned from COVID-19 and has it altered your view on the role of public health? I think, um, you know, that this is probably just my bias uh, speaking, but for, for me, this really emphasizes the importance of, of reimagining public health itself um, as a data science. And I don't just mean a data science in, in the way that like it's, you know, we, we know how to run regressions and we do surveys and generate it. You know, all science is data. Um, and so what would it mean for public health to be a data science? I think the first thing that it would mean is really investing in the data. Um, I, I mentioned before this kind of counterintuitive sense that you know, the, the NFL or, or, or the White House detection of cases was not a failure, it was a success. Um, I would be actually happier if I saw more diagnosed cases at Richmond, because it would mean that we're investing in the data collection capacity that we need to diagnose these epidemics. So really investing um, and taking the data collection seriously, while also integrating insights from a lot of new disciplines, um, computer science, economics, all of the other disciplines that, that have a lot to contribute um, to this area. And, and I'll just give you one example that, that I've been thinking about recently around contact tracing. So there's this, um, you probably uh, know this paradox, the, the friendship paradox, which is that your, your friends have more friends than you do. Um, uh, Berkeley students will, will know a related version, which is that um, your classes seem larger than the average Berkeley class size because you are in the large classes and those classes are large. Um, and so there's this you know, basic insight from network science that should be informing how we do contact tracing, not just in the US, but around the world, which is that the person who gave you COVID has infected more people than you will. So when we do contact tracing, we do forward tracing. In other words, we find the people who's been infected and we find the people that you know, they've been in contact with. What we should be doing in addition to that is finding the person who infected them backwards contact tracing. Um, and I think that's a simple but very profound um, idea. And it's an example of how public health can be much, much more powerful by integrating um, these kinds of insights and really taking um, both the investments in the data and what we do with it very seriously. Let, let me ask you a, a related question. In 2006, epidemiologist Larry Brilliant warned us about the inevitability of a deadly global pandemic and called for the establishment of a global early warning system to facilitate early detection and early response uh, to contain an outbreak before it spreads. We have early warning system for earthquakes and we have early warning system for tsunamis. Why don't we have early warning system for pandemics? And what might that look like and how can AI help? Yeah, I'll, I'll just tell you very briefly about um, two, two things that, um, uh, that I think might help here. So one is a project that, um, that I've been working on with uh, colleagues um, in a very, very large healthcare system, um, stretching from the Pacific Northwest all the way down to Southern California, where essentially we are pulling all of the x-rays that they do in all of their sites um, and training an algorithm to crawl through those images and look for new things. Um, and so that, you know, we're using that to build prognostic models for um, patients who are presenting with symptoms that might be COVID. Um, one of the things that, um, that I think is really terrifying about COVID um, that I saw as a, as a clinician uh, in the ER um, this past summer is that it's very hard to know who's gonna deteriorate. And so training an algorithm to find people uh, on the basis of what their x-ray looks like to pick up on those subtle clues that a radiologist might miss, um, you can predict deterioration, but you can use that same data, those same algorithms to create a passive detection system that constantly looks at these new images that are coming in. Um, and you can imagine that being something that would be very useful at ports of entry to the US, um, you know, hospitals serving major transport hubs um, to identify new pathogens that we haven't seen before, just unusual patterns. I think another uh, really promising area that I, that I think will come out of the um, new ways that we hope to test people um, with COVID is just better and cheaper massive surveillance systems 
um, oriented towards detecting lots and lots of different kinds of DNA in lots and lots of different places. And so I think as this demand for COVID testing will dramatically drive down the cost of detecting um, genetic material, I think it'll open up a lot of new opportunities to do much, much better data-driven surveillance. And, and even all the major outbreaks in the 21st century have resulted from a viral spillover. Uh, that's when the virus jumps over from an animal host to a human host. Uh, and with more than 800,000 viruses capable of spillover kind of lurking in the wild, and with the perfect storm of climate change and urbanization, globalization and deforestation, and the relentless harvesting of wildlife and encroachment on their habitats uh, that have really kind of brought these viruses uh, closer to human than ever before. What must we do to stop future spillovers? So I think there's many different aspects. Um, one of them is being very, well, it's, increasing the capacity to, for surveillance and um, identification very early on, um, risk assessment um, on site. And I think that one of the most critical aspects is building capacity in country and building trusted relationships on the ground, um, which is like, utterly critical because that's it's where all of the, what you're mentioning is like X meets the human contact is, you know, when we've been hearing, you know, wet markets and, you know, caves and this and that, but I mean, right around these areas where there is that initial interaction or, you know, avian flu, et cetera. I mean, th those are where we need to have the capacity to detect very early um, and to not just to detect, but also to respond and to report and to have that one really excellent global global communication, which is, you know, what's, you know, was much better this time than in previous times, but we have learned so much from this pandemic as well in terms of how badly um, we were the world as a whole, especially the United States, I think, was ready to respond. So there's many different levels. Um, but I, the, the risk assessment, I mean, on several levels, one is, you know, at the level of where uh, there could be spillover. Um, but another is also once there is um, a potential pathogen identified, or a group of pathogens, like coronaviruses were known to be, you know, in bats and be have potential for for, for spillover, but th there's biological testing which can be done to understand what kind of uh, receptors do they need, what kind of cells could they infect, are those receptors and whatnot in human cells, and a lot of work that can be done on that level as well, their ability to, to, for pathogenesis, their ability to transmit. So all that can be, do, can be going on um, and, uh, and is very important. Uh, and, 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 like, and also, of course, then really it's the response and having the public health response in countries and the ability to contact trace and you know, et cetera. And that was like the rest of our conversations earlier. One thing that's exciting is that um, NIH actually just formed a large network, which actually was um, done prior uh, to the pandemic, but we actually just got funded now is a set of uh, groups called the um, Centers for um, uh, research and investigation for emerging and in infectious diseases. Um, and there's 10 centers that were just awarded. Um, there's essentially a large consortium of consortia. Um, and so when we actually got one at UC Berkeley, um, which involves Sri Lanka, Ecuador, and Nicaragua, but it's, it's actually very exciting because there's 10 um, really wonderful centers that span 29 countries. And are a lot of the people that have been really on the front lines of doing the response to um, mosquito-borne diseases, to the you know Ebola and other filoviruses, et cetera. So I think that you know if this flourishes, and this is not the only one group, but many places, that's gonna be a really great kind of first response responder, if you wish, um, in the face of new pandemics. Great. And uh, our, uh, I'm going to give you the last word on this since we're coming up on time. Let, let's talk about what we learned uh, in public health, uh, that, that the U.S. Uh, public health system okay, used to be the envy of the world. Uh, we used to be a global leader uh, in public health. Uh, and yet I, I think uh, COVID-19 has really uh, has shown us the price we pay uh, for chronic underinvestment uh, in, in public health. So, so all the countries that have crushed uh, the, the epidemic uh, all have strong public health system, workforce, leadership. Uh, what went wrong with us this time and what must we do differently in the future? 
Well, just uh, obviously that topic could take days to talk about uh, and you get lots of different opinions. I'll just make several comments. Um, f f first of all, um, uh, you know, uh, obviously politics has, is, is always at play when we're in public health. It, it's never absent. Uh, I think lamentably it's been more of a factor in this particular response than I've ever seen in my 40 years in public health. And I think that's been to the detriment of public health by and large. Uh, secondly, uh, so if we can I insulate uh, uh, public health better uh, from, from politics. That, that may be unrealistic, but that would be a good thing to do. Uh, secondly, you're right, we've underinvested in public health infrastructure in this country for decades. Um, but the problem is we really don't have one system. Each of the 50 states has its own system. Each of the territories has its own system. And we don't have a single system. Um, but, but, but um, and we, systematically underinvest because it's easy to underfund and, and to and to cut uh, when nothing bad seems to be happening. So I think that's a that's a political issue in terms of maturity of politicians and taxpayers in terms of what they're willing to pay for. Um, but but uh, could we do better? Yes, we can certainly do better. The kinds of things that Ziad has pointed to, um, the technologies and, and the sciences are there um, if we're willing to invest well, wise words to uh, end today's town hall. Um, uh, please join me in thanking our panelists, uh, doctors Eva Harris, Zia Obermeyer, Art Reingold, John Schwartzberg, and Theodore Ernoff. I'm Michael Liu. Uh, thank you for joining us today. And please join us again uh, for our next Berkeley town hall uh, as we continue to bring you the most accurate and the most up-to-date information on COVID-19. Take care and stay well, everyone. See you next time.